hospitality from the Steel City, but right now we're in West London in my studio, the Steve's Palace. That's right. You might hear me on the radio, see me in a dance, see me on social media trying to sell you a t-shirt, but more time, I'm based here. That's right, in West London in my music studio trying to make music right from nothing to potentially something good. It's where I feel most comfortable. It's my style, vibe and fashion. This is Tully T Studio, Studio Bounce, mad. I've been producing since I was about 13, so that's a long time now, that's all I'm saying about my age. Um, and I've been DJing since I was about nine, 10. And it's funny, because when I started playing records and buying records, I think I was trying to produce without realizing, because I'd always try and put acapellas on beats, get a part of a song and put a beat over it and stuff like that. The turntables I had at the time didn't even have pitch on. So as you can imagine, it just sounded like a mess. But I think my mind wanted to make records without realizing and buying records in Sheffield growing up, going to the record shop, mainly buying rap music and hip hop music. But at the same time, when you're in a record shop, as you know, you will explore different sounds and different vibes. So I might buy a house record one week or a reggae record one week or whatever. And that kind of got me into a place where when I was making music, it, a lot of the time, initially, it was quite tracing big American producers, but I just make stuff with kind of all kinds of things going on. And it was just in my mum's bedroom back home in a little office space. I think I'm from the generation where we were, you know, uh, lucky enough to have a computer in the house, whereas generations before me didn't have that. They had to go studio. So I got like Hip Hop EJ, which is like a real basic package free on a magazine and tried to make samples fit together and sit together. And that was the start of making music. Um, in the office in my mum's house in Sheffield and from there I just kind of got more immersed in the Sheffield scene and sound and would go to proper studios and there was a guy called Ross Orton who is still one of my biggest inspirations and heroes who had a studio above a chicken shop on London Road and he kindly brought me in for a day and to help him actually work on a remix because I, by that time I was really good on the computer and he was more analogue based and in that day I learnt more than any magazine, any college tuition, any sit-in session. And I still kind of remember that day so clearly. He produced a lot of early MIA material. And at the time, he was kind of like the go-to guy for a remix. And I sat in on the session and the way he worked was so, so uncompromising and so breaking so many rules. It kind of taught me from early, yeah, you can go college and you can do this and you can learn how stuff's supposed to be done or you can just do it your way. Um, that was like 15, 16, and that kind of gave me confidence and my own sort of self-belief and palette to just do what the F you want to do and do it your way. The Root and Foundation is undoubtedly British sound system culture, but with that is the tree, which is grime and hip hop and jungle and rave and soul and all these styles. So I guess I fit under that bracket musically and thankfully being in Sheffield at that time, like I say, made me that guy. Way. Well, I, I got, when I moved to London properly about six years ago, Red Light moved at the same time from Bristol, and he's a good friend of mine. And so we needed a space. He's mad organised, so he found this. And I was like, yeah, I'll rent the other room. So there's a small room in there that I rented for a good three or four years. I made the majority of my second record in there, worked on loads of records in there for different artists. It's actually quite funny because it's so small now, I can't believe I'd had certain people in there. Like we had Miss Dynamite in there, super small, bashy in there doing his material. Some people come from Jamaica and it's sitting there. I'm thinking, nah, raw, that was a bit weird because it was like just going to someone's small bathroom. But it worked for so long. When he moved that, I thought, right, big man thing. I've got a big man room now. I've, I've done two albums. I'm stepping up. And I was going to rent out the second room, but selfishly, I just loved having the space to myself. But it's become studio stroke bedroom stroke carnival storage centre. So if when you look around, there's just stuff from my carnival stage everywhere that is conveniently can be placed in here because my stage is just over the road. So there's just stuff like even here now, there's like bandanas and that that are just here left over. It's not even conscious of like a big, like some stuff from the stage in there. There's loads of drinks in the other room that got left over. So it's become like a storage stroke studio stroke bedroom. And I just love coming down in it, feeling that rather than it being like really like clean studio. I don't like that vibe. It never really works for me. So I come down here, I can do everything. Obviously make tracks, vocal people, we do, my radio prep in here and it's my little space. Technically, it's got everything I need and I just wanted to make it comfortable and feel like I was going to my second bedroom rather than going to this really like sort of place where if you spill a water, it's crisis. Like, I can't do that, especially because as you can see, I'm quite messy. So it works perfect. Well, it's funny because like, I've got a lot of hardware as you can see, but 
I've actually stripped it down so much, particularly recently. Like these two machines at the top here, MS20, sorry, MS20 SH09, were two synths that were always in studios in Sheffield, and I just this was like a sort of particularly this SH09 was like the sort of palette of the Sheffield sound. And I always wanted one so bad, but it was quite hard to find them, particularly when I was there. It was it's very expensive, so. These are my like, even though they just look like black keyboards, these for me growing up were like, I need these. Ross has got one, or Chris Morris has got one, or Duck and Field's got one. These are all producers I looked up to. So uh, these are like the Sheffield machines to me. And then this Juno is more for like chords and more kind of like, what you could say, softer sounds. And this is just a master keyboard. But recently, particularly in the last year, because of the technology, I don't leave the box. Like, I work on this so much these have become a bit redundant look how dusty it is man that's disrespect sorry mate but so it going it and then i've got like a vocal booth in there and it all comes through to my little setup here which is just a chain of a preamp compressor and then it hits the sound card and it's super simple i've got my monitors some vocals which are the first monitors i've ever had that i truly truly understand so i can do everything in here from vocal and artist to mix down and it's super simple this could go a lot of that could go and I could still make the same record. It's just, I can't get rid of these. These are my little spiritual babies. And um, it took me so long and they were so aspirational to have these. I just, it's like selling records. I can't do it, you know what I mean? So I ain't gonna lie, I don't use them too tough anymore, but they're just part of the journey. And that's why they're still even though they're dusty. Studio must haves, well, um, obviously you need speakers and my computer, they're the two. I can make anything out of them, but then I just obsessed with caffeine when I'm here. I was bouncing around the place. I dropped my son off at school at 8.30. I walked down and get a fat coffee. In the first three hours, I'm the man. I'm bouncing up the walls. Everything sounds amazing. Wee! This is amazing. And then about midday, I'm like, everything's rubbish. Like, uh. So it's the caffeine-infused mornings where I get everything done really kind of like creatively. And then the rest of the day is like picking up the unreality of what those three hours were and like tidying rhythms and making emails and coming back to reality rather than thinking I'm DJ Premier or Neptunes. So it's like the kind of like the space, the time of the day and coffee is when I'm always like really hammering home the more creative side of stuff and the rest of the day I'm picking it up and then by six o'clock I'm a dad again. So it kind of works really well. Way, I've been working on a project for two years just over, I've had loads of beats on my laptop and I thought, you know what, it's time to put them together as a project because my first album came out in 2009, my second record came out in 2012, and I haven't done a solid consolidated product for so long. I wanted to revisit that side of me as a producer. Making a record is so different from churning out a club tune or a tune for an artist that goes on their project. I wanted to do something really cohesive and mine again. So I had loads of beats on my laptop. And it's funny because I can't really just make music. You say to me, go make a reggae tune. I can, but it'll sound like I've tried to make one. You say, go make a grime tune, I'll go and it, it'll, I'll be trying to be rude, kid. And it won't have no spirit. But when I sit here and I just go into my vibes and go into my zone, things just happen and they sound natural and they sound real. But that can be any type of style depending on how I feel. And around that time of making music, for some reason I was making a lot of kind of like soul influenced and R&B boogie, a lot of chord progressions, a lot of softer sounding stuff than say the harder club stuff. And I had all these beats and I didn't know what to do with them, but I knew I wanted to put it into a project. And just by coincidence, I went to New York to play for Mix Pack, which is a dancehall kind of sound system. And I played the set and I played loads of garage and grime and dancehall and it was great. And then the next day I went to studio and I wanted to work with a rapper so bad because I was in New York and I'm a hip hop boy at heart. So I'm like, yo, where's the rappers? I couldn't find none. I don't think no one wanted to work with me, fair enough. I called loads of my friends. I says, yo, I'm in New York. Is there any rappers? Where, where, where? Long story short, I spoke to Switch, who is my friend who's based in America and he works with everyone from Bieber to all the way to like really kind of underground weird stuff. And he was like, yo, listen, I got this woman, Andrea Martin, she's based in New York, she's amazing, just go studio with her. I'm like, all right, cool. But I've got singers back home, man, I want to work with a rapper. Nah, Switch says so, let me try it. And then I went to studio. Luckily, a friend of mine had a space in Manhattan. I spoke to her, she turned up, dressed in all white because she was what she called cleansing. I weren't allowed to touch her because she was cleansing. I'm like, yo, this woman's interesting still. I knew her work anyway. And I played all the beats I had, had that sort of chordal vibe going on, a soulful like, edge. So I know she'd be perfect for them. So let me try this anyway. She goes in the booth. And within two minutes, I was like, oh my 
gosh, this lady needs to vocal my record because the spirit that she brought to the record and the way she vocaled was like nothing I've ever heard or seen. Like rappers go in and dance all guys particularly go in, they put their headphones on and they come up with ideas and then they come out and they write to it. With soul R&B and more singer songwriter based stuff, more time that someone might do a little melody and then come for, she just literally did a song there and then. And I thought, my gosh, the spirit of this lady is unbelievable. So I decided from that moment, I wanted her to voice the majority of my record and glue it together. So that's been a very, very complex and tooth combed project via the internet. I've only met her once, which was that day. And she gave me a lift home in a big truck and she's mad cool, mad cool. And we speak a lot. And she voiced the majority of this record that I've been working on. And then we've been sprinkling it with artists from the UK and Jamaica in between. So big up Angie because she's the spirit of this project and she glued it perfect. Yo, my titty big, I'm about to large up. Bell the fuck, fuck, fuck till it mark up. Big, big, big black branch park up. Push button, make the big thing start up. Boom! Beast. Tell the T featuring Andrea Martin, Steph London. Now, this is a mad one because I actually had a session with this guy called Bart Hoven, who's a sick young youth from London. His brother's actually M and EK. Anyway, he hit me up and he said, I want to come studio and vibes and very well. And of course, let's do it. And he's actually came in the intention, I think we were going to vocal him properly as like an artist, but he's a sick producer as well. So what we actually did was like build us some beats from scratch. And a lot of this song is actually sampling his voice. So he did little stabs and little harmonies and things and I built a beat out of it. So the essence of that session was meant for a track for him and it just turned into something completely different. Now, if we look at the two main elements of this record, there's a really synthy dreamy bit and then it goes into like a sort of tough stripped back electronic style. And obviously on top of that, you've got vocals from Andrew and Steph. But I gassed it and said, I don't use this kit anymore on the interview, but actually a big part of this record is the Juno 106. Um, I wrote some chords and it just sounds so beautiful on that old hissy, it's not quite perfect piece of kit that you do get out of a computer. Because a lot of the time with a computer, it sounds perfect, which is great, but sometimes you want it to sound a bit rubbish. I know that sounds mental, but you kind of want it to sound slightly out of tune, slightly, slightly hissy. It all, it's all character and it's all almost human to a synth. So, the synth. If you listen to that properly loud, there's loads of hissing which is from the chorus effect on that, which you wouldn't really get on a computer. Then the bass note on that. It's off that as well. It's, again, it's not, it's not perfect pitch. It's just got a bag of spirit to it. So the breakdown that goes, which is actually the chorus, it goes into the harder bit. The essence is actually off the Juno. And then on top of that, you have uh, a little paddy thing that, that bit there, which is simple. As you can see here, it's, it's a lot more clean and some people may say more perfect and that's a VSTI so that comes out of the computer you can see it there what instrument is that oh it's called the Juno pad which is basically trying to rip off that but as you could hear there there's bag more spirit in the original Juno and then all these voices you can hear here is man like Bart Oven so he done this little thing here to take the reverb off it's just a heart it's just him singing I've just looped it. And then the low one is, again, him singing a little piece. I'm not gonna try and sing that for you because it's gonna sound horrible, but the way he does it, it's great. So it sounds like an instrument rather than two voices sometimes, like when you hear it, it's drenched in reverb and stuff. And then you have properly sampled his voice here again. Uh, that's just a little chop of his, what does it actually sing? It was... Right, this is where it gets a bit mad because he's got him saying ah, uh, and then it sounds like a DJ scratch, uh, 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 but it's just a chop of that same phrase. Have I pitched it? Yeah, I pitched it down minus seven, six, sorry there, and up four there, so it's like, sounds like a, sounds like a DJ or something, but it, all it is is his voice. Now that bit there is mad because that doesn't sound anything like a human, it sounds like a mouse. But that's just his voice pitched right up and processed again, it back into that. So if you hear it as a phrase, it's uh, and then it's the, the mouse thing, uh, it's simple. And then what Andrea done in, beneath it is her vocals all the way from New York 
That's just her saying. You know I got that, I'm all about that. They love that, etc. Really wet, so really kind of intentionally quite dreamy. So that's Juno. Bart Oven's voice. A fake Juno and Andrea Martin. Really. And then the beast bit, which is the title of the song, which is here, is intentionally really dry and like almost like sample based and a beast. A beast. It's almost a like beast. I wanted it to sound like a sample, like rather than it being like a really well executed piece of harmonic vocal. It's just a beast. It's just her saying a beast, so it's like a sample. That wants that to be dry compared to the wetness of all that dreamy, euthoric, almost a beefer vibes or something and then it drops into the nuttiness which the way it drops is super simple it's just a kick drum really like hardly got any bass in it almost tinny i've actually got rid of some sub on it it's kind of horrible to be honest when it by itself sounds horrible but then massive all sub underneath it real simple super simple two notes what are we on d g sharp Du, 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 du. Real, real simple stuff. And then again, it, it's a cool, um, it's, it's so different to the real kind of musical spaced outness and it just drops into the kick and that. And uh, shout to um, Bart Over because he actually wrote that bass line as well over there. Just real simple vibes thing. Now this bit's probably the most unexpected bit because that sounds like a synth, right? But what it actually is, is again, I sampled his voice. If you hear this thing here without any, uh, this has got what you call an arpeggiator on it, which is basically for people like me who are rubbish at playing instruments. It makes you sound like you're going like this or moving around on a keyboard. But if you hear it, all I've done with this is sample his voice again. Uh, uh. So that's his phrase, whatever he sung in the booth. Super simple. I made a chord out of it. And then when you put the arpeggiator on it, it skips it. So it skips it between note, note for note. I'm back. So that is actually his voice pitched around in a, of a chord with an arpeggiator, but then I ragged it through some hot hardware down here. Which is, this is called the distressor, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It stresses things out and it sounds really horrible and distorted, but still got the punch. So that's what that is. That's it. That's it's so minimal, the actual beat. And then just the. Simplified the bass for the verse part where she starts singing um, with a one note boom. And then obviously, Andrea's absolute killer lead vocal that she sent in from New York. And I got a big up my brother Benji B for putting the snare on this. I went to his studio and he said, This is brilliant, but put a snare on it. I was going then, and he put a snare on it. So hang tight, Benji, on that one there. Snare done. And it's as simple as that. It then goes, goes back to the euthoria bit as such. I'm back in to the more tougher bit. This time Steph comes in and shuts it. Jeez. She wrote that right there. She came in a Range Rover, wrote it in about 10 minutes, shot it in about two minutes. I went to another studio session and there's actually a lyric in it. Where is it? Yeah, big... Big, big black range park. She parked a range outside, came in, done that, and then got off back in the range to another session. And it just gave the energy of the track. And her, the way she sounds, she just sits perfect. So it was just the energy in the middle of the tune. At the end, it just rides out back to Andrea. Back to a more smooth vibe and off. So really, it's a real simple, minimal record. There's hardly any elements, particularly in the verse parts, but every single piece is quite considered. And I think, I say this to a lot of people a lot of the time, but it's compared to cooking. 
I'm a rubbish cook, so it's a bit weird for me to preach this, but if you get three really amazing ingredients that work together really well, like a, a banging beans on toast with the right cheese and a crust and all that, that's going to taste way better than some super complex overthought beans on toasting in your taste. You think it's too much from my mouth. Nah, dog. Simplicity, if you can get it right, for me, Amaya's always works best. And on this record, I think Steph and Barthoven's bits, and of course, Andrew and Martin, the flavourings on them and my simple instrumental just work. And I think less is more as much as possible in music. And I think we managed to succeed with that one there, being a simple record with the right ingredients. And it's a beast. Studio Bounce, it's turned the team. My album is called Foreign Light, that's how you pronounce. Out very soon. It's been an absolute movie and a sitcom. Big up Jam Supernova every time. In the place to be. West London style and fashion. Steve Studio, turned the team. Studio Bounce. Wow. <laughs>